next speaker uh, is Ofer Zaytuni, and he will tell us about the extremal landscape for the characteristic polynomial of the C beta. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about the work that is uh, squarely within the uh, random metric side of this complex and not within the random Schrodinger operator. And it's all work with, uh, the work I'm going to describe is joint work with Elliot Paquet, with here. Um, and let me, let me introduce, so Jonathan in his introductory talk mentioned Jacobi matrices and he kind of mentioned quickly in passing that there is an analog for matrices which are, which have eigenvalue for unitary or orthogonal matrices. So this is a starting point. The starting point is this joint distribution of eigenvalues. Note the parameter beta, which for people from algebra is not natural unless, well, actually that's not quite true, but usually it's uh, beta equal two, which is the most natural one. Then it's just the eigenvalues of a random unitary matrix taken from the half measure. Um, but this makes sense uh, for any uh, real positive beta. And, uh, and, uh, and it gives you a, a distribution of eigenvalues. And actually, that's the only player you need to know for my talk. So you can forget about random matrices and just think of point charges with repulsion, with logarithmic type repulsion, which are constrained to sit on the unit circle. That's, that's one way to think about it. But it is also reassuring to know that there is a matrix model for all these things. So there are random matrices for any beta um, that looks like the Jacobi matrices, but not quite. They have five diagonals and not three that have the spectrum satisfying this kind of relation. OK. So uh, what kind of questions we want to ask? Well, one of the, of course, uh, it's not you could ask questions like, in the language that Jonathan talked about this morning, what is the empirical measure? What is the, the, the density of state for this matrix? And because everything is rotation invariant, it's not so complicated and difficult to convince yourself immediately that it should converge to the uniform measure on the circle. And indeed, uh, the density of state here is somewhat boring. Or the limit of the density of state is somewhat boring. But you can make it slightly more interesting by asking the following question. Well, let's take a sum, let's take f <coughs> to be a nice continuous function, maybe smooth, and look at the linear statistics. So you have here a sum of f of lambda i. Here you have the expectation of that sum. Note that I do not normalize by anything. So this is not like uh, your usual central limit COM from the books. It's just this object. And you can ask, where does that, what, what is the limit law of this object? And uh, one, uh, so introduce these quantities. So this. Of course, if I write sigma square, this eventually will be a variance. Introduce this in terms of the Fourier coefficients of f. And, and a nice observation, going back to Sego, is that you can write the expectation of this product, or the multiple integral of this product, as a certain toplitz determinant. And then by the Sego and by the strong Sego theorem, actually, you get the asymptotics of that toplitz determinant. So it has a leading order that has, that has to do with a DC term, with a constant term in the Fourier decomposition. And then the next order is of order one. Okay, So that's what you get. And in particular, the quantity ZF, this expectation is exactly taking out this DC term, it will converge because of this convergence of characteristic function. This will converge to a Gaussian uh, normal random variable. And this was complemented uh, maybe 25 years ago by Johnson, 
who actually introduced the technique of integration by parts and got a very sharp rate of convergence in this theorem, among many other things. Okay, what I will be interested in is a characteristic polynomial, which in terms of the eigenvalues, uh, so you can write it like that, but of course this is nothing but the product of the exponential of sum of f of lambda i, where f is this function. So we are really interested in this type of uh, send of uh, questions as before, where you have a sum of functions of lambda i, and you're trying to understand the limit. Now, uh, if you compute the Fourier coefficients, they will behave like 1 over k. So this sigma f square that I described is blowing up. It's infinite. So of course, you, the, the limit theorem that I stated is nonsense as stated. Now, on the other hand, you can play the following game, at least for beta equal 2, you can play the following game. You can look at traces of your matrix. So your matrix, the traces of the ma matrix are exactly, uh, um, uh, you can think of them as linear statistics of eigenvalues. In this case, the sum of eigenvalues, the sum of eigenvalues square, etc., as function of k. And also, uh, quite a while ago, Diakonis and Shashani, by algebraic means, made the observation that these traces converge to a normal random variable, of variance k. In fact, they proved something extremely strong. This convergence is not just you have a convergence, but the convergence is in the form that the jth moment of this trace exactly equals the jth moment of a Gaussian random variable. In this case, for beta equal 2, you have to do the complex analog of what I write here. Uh, so it's exactly equal to j. j. Sorry, j. j. No, this no. is j. So you take u n to the power k, and you raise it to the power j. On the right, on the right hand side, it will be the, the here is uh, the, the there's a j missing. Okay. Yes, this this will be uh, this will be j and this will be k. Thank you. So the models exa the moments exactly match the Gaussians as long as k times j is smaller than capital N. So there is a kind of phase transition. As soon as n hits that integer barrier, the moments are exactly the same. And this comes from you can compute moments by some dia diagrammatic <coughs> expansion or by representation theory, whatever your favorite way, and this is what you, what you find. Now, if you write formally the expansion of the log determinant, which is what should be a linear statistic, and you expand it formally, you get this kind of expansion. So, uh, <coughs> of course, on the unit <laughs> circle, what you see is that you have uh, these guys, by the result of Diakonis and Shashahani, they converge to a Gaussian with variance k. So this whole thing will give you, if you compute the variance, something like 1 over k times something. And so formally, if you take such a formula and you write expressions formally, you conclude that this object should look like a logarithmically correlated field. Namely, the correlations are supposed to blow up at a point logarithmically in n. So the variance will blow up logarithmically in n and should decay logarithmically in the distance at scale 1 over n. And in fact, just formally, if you take this trace and you replace that by the proper Gaussian random variable, this should very much behave like this random trigonometric series. So that's the beginning of the story. And about 20 years ago, people went around and proved such statements. For example, Keating and Snaith, uh, I'll tell, say something about the motivation in a second, but what they proved is that if you look at the log determinant and you normalize by square root log n, you indeed converge to a Gaussian one. So at the level of heuristic, it all fits together. Both the representation, as I said, in terms of random Gaussian variables, the formula 
of uh, the Sego theorem with the proper limit of sigma f square, which now you cannot take as a limit as n to in going to infinity, but you have to stop at the appropriate truncation of the power series, etc. And uh, so there were, there were several works on that, Keating and Snaith and Weyand, who was a, at the time a student of Diaconis. And uh, I think Hughes, Keatings, and O'Connell were the first to actually prove a log correlated type statement. Namely, if you take that object and you integrate against test functions, so this object without the normalization, and you integrate against a smooth test function, you get a Gaussian limit which corresponds to a, a logarithmic kernel. OK, now. Me, I come from, I come from many directions, but in particular in the last, uh, I don't know how many years, I've been interested in logarithmically correlated fields. And the theory is extremely well developed for Gaussian ones. For Gaussian ones, we understand a lot about what happens with a logarithmically correlated field. In particular, we can say things about the maximum of this this object. So note, this object does not converge to anything, right? The variance blows up point-wise. So you get a random function for every finite n. This is a random function. It's a polynomial, after all, the characteristic polynomial. So the logarithm is a nice function. And you can ask about the maximum. And if you just believe as a trust that this is log Gaussian, that this should behave like the maximum of log correlated field, uh, then you do a back of envelope computation and you convince yourself that it should look like a certain centering, a certain thing that should blow up because the whole thing blows up, and then order one fluctuations. And the general theory nowadays also predicts for Gaussian fields what this order one fluctuations should be. But at the time, there was no general field. So at, at the time, this gentleman, one of whom is sitting here in the audience, made a conjecture that looks completely crazy. And the conjecture is, of course, they had good reasons for making the conjecture. But uh, the conjecture is that this order one term is just a sum of two Gumbel random variables, independent Gumbel random variables. So the two Gumbel random, a Gumbel random variable is a Gumbel whose distribution function looks like this. So it's a doubly exponential. It has super fast decay on one side and an exponential decay on the other. And that's what they obtained. And their conjecture was motivated by questions related to the maximum of the Riemann zeta function. So in particular, <laughs> this kind of, of conjecture about the maximum is in this big arsenal of analogies between Riemann zeta functions and random matrix results. This was another one. And, and the object it corresponds to is essentially the following. What's random in a Riemann zeta function? Nothing, a priori. But if you look at the critical axis, and you take a short interval of size one, okay? So we can do that. So is that clear? So the critical, you have this critical axis on the complex plane at one half, and you take here a short interval of length one. And now we introduce randomness. You do it at a random location between capital T and two capital. And you take t to infinity. Okay? So we got a random variable. We started with a deterministic object, and you take this random thing, you get a random variable, you look at the log of the modulus of the Riemann zeta function on that interval, and you look at its maximum. And lo and behold, they conjecture that the limit is exactly the same limit. Correct? Yeah, with, yeah. with, some, with some corrections that you can write down explicitly. OK? There's also a translation of t and n that you have to do, and some factors that you have to take out, and et cetera. OK. So, uh, what, were, so what, what, what is known? So, so 
what is known in this con very nice conjectural picture. So, th so the, the story I want to tell you is starting about eight years ago now, seven or eight years ago. Um, and in short succession, the following three things were proved. First of all, <coughs> uh, remember what is a conjecture. So the conjecture is that this thing should behave like log n minus three quarter for people in log who know something about log correlated fields. Three quarter is really three half in the usual uh, terminology, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, and uh, our gamma of garden values proved that actually the first term, the leading order, is correct. Shortly after, with Elliot, we computed the second order term. Now, that's, that may seem like a technical improvement, but the point is that the second order term is the first place where you see the log correlation. If the field is not co log correlated, you would see a different constant here. And very shortly after hours, really the, the, the amazing result of Chaibi, Madol, and Najnudel came out, in which they proved, I didn't say that, but these two results were limited to beta equal 2, and they used special integrability that you have for beta equal 2. In particular, our work used very strongly this representation in terms of toplitz determinants. Uh, but what Chaibi, Madol, and Najnudel proved is actually that you have an order one term. So that was a very significant step toward that conjecture, um, which predicted the limit. And um, before I tell you a bit more about the approach, <laughs> let me mention there is a somewhat less developed analog on the real line in the form of Jacobi equations. So there also, for beta equal two, things are known in quite the wrong techniques to do asymptotic expansions that are uh, very precise. For general results, the CLT came out uh, um, um, about a couple of years ago with work of Bourgard, Modi, and Payne, and of uh, Augery, Bittes, and myself. And there's also important work of, uh, of uh, uh, Paquet, Lambert and uh, Paquet that, uh, they will, that I guess Elliot will somewhat put, touch about here. OK. Now, uh, there are also results for, for, for people who are close to such things. There are results about uh, Gaussian multiplicative Gauss uh, convergence, but this I don't want to touch upon. I do want to tell you something about what is a CMN approach, because this will look to you surprisingly similar to some stuff in in Sasha's talk, even though it's really a different problem. So it's based on, on the theory of orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle. And it's really a representation that, uh, um, that is um, an analog of the Jacobi one that was mentioned and is due to Dimitrio and Edelman. This one is a representation that was uh, done by Kilip and Nensiu. And uh, I'm just telling you the results. I don't want to say anything about how this is derived. <coughs> so if you take gamma j square, j, the, or the modulus of gamma j square, to be independent beta random variable. So that's just a particular formula here. And you take coefficients alpha j, which are these guys, with a uniform phase on the unit circle. Okay. One thing to note is that these random variables, as j increases, these random variables look more and more like Gaussians around the room. So that's not very hard to convince yourself. And, um, and then you form the following recursion. So that's a recursion of orthogonal polynomials. So in the language of Sasha, if you want to understand this guy at time n, you just get a bunch of a product of a bunch of independent, not IID, independent random matrices. Okay? Because this al alpha k are independent, but no, not <coughs> IID. And uh, okay, in this representation, 
uh, what Kelly and Nancy, Nancy showed is that you can write, so first of all, you can write this as orthogonal polynomials related to the spectral measure of, of, of certain matrices, but more important, the determinant you can write as a linear combination involving one more random variables of these vectors. Okay? So is, is the situation clear? So once we have that, we know that if we solve those recursions and we take an extra independent random variables, then we can find out the limit of the determinant. Okay? And, uh, and in fact, if you write it as an equation now, you get an equation of this form. So you have, uh, you can rewrite the phi star as a, the log is just a sum plus an extra term. And this and extra term involves certain uh, uh, terms called proof of phases, which just satisfy this recursion. Okay? So this is the input to the machine. The input of the machine is this algebraic representation of the orthogonal polynomial and the three term. It's really three terms recursion for a particular spectral measure. Now, one thing to observe, which is kind of crucial, is the following. Uh, this, of course, is a Markov chain because the value of psi k plus one depends on psi k, not just as an increment, but also because it enters here. However, if you look at the fixed theta, the, the psi, even if you condition on psi, the law of that increment will be independent of it, simply because alpha has a uniform phase on the unit circle. So the term that you are adding, if you, add, if you take a single theta, is going to look very much like a random walk. Actually, it is exactly a random walk, except that the <laughs> variance is not the same at each step. And in fact, the variance will be of order 1 over j. But you, you, even if you condition on this psi, if you look at a single angle, this psi is not important. OK? So you have this recursion for the, for the phi star. And therefore, you have immediately a pointwise central limit theorem for the log of phi star. And then it's an easy exercise to see that you get it for the, the log of the characteristic polynomial. OK? So, uh, so uh, one thing I want to. So you could say, ah, it's all a ga you have an easy, a cheap Gaussian convergence. Therefore, we should be able to do the Gaussian convergence towards uh, results from the log correlated fields immediately. So there are two, two issues with that that I want to point out to you. One is, um, one is uh, somewhat technical, and the other is actually uh, fundamental. So the technical part is that if you look at two different angles, what I said is not correct. So if you looked at the joint law <coughs> of two different angles, this does not behave like a, exactly like a pair of log correlated Gaussians. Because now the dependence, now you, you, only have, you only gain once this gain from the uniform angle. But the relative phase between two angles is going to make these two vectors not jointly Gaussian, okay? or not jointly random walks. That's maybe the more important thing. The second thing is, before you get too excited about saying, ah, oh, the maximum should converse, think of the minimum. If we have a Gaussian field, the maximum and the minimum behave in the same way. But what is the minimum of the characteristic polynomial on the unit circle, it's just zero, because there are eigenvalues on the unit circle. So the log of the characteristic polynomial, the minimum, the infimum of that will be minus infinity. Whereas I'm telling you results about the maximum. So there's a fundamental difference between the supremum and the infimum, and that, that makes the analysis not quite a direct analysis of <laughs> convergence to Gaussian. Okay, 
So here is a result that I want to advertise. So first of all, take this centering that we discussed before. Then if you look at the maximum of the log determinant, you subtract the centering, you get the sum of a Gaussian and something. Uh, sorry, not a Gaussian, a Gumbel and something. So remember, the conjecture was that you should get G1 plus G2. So the conjecture is that the something should be a Gumbel itself. Okay? But what, what this paper proves is that you have an independent sum of a gamble and something, and I'll tell you in a moment what this something is. There is very strong evidence that this something is indeed gamble, but this, this is not proved yet. Uh, this is some work that eventually, I'm, I'm sure it will be proved, but uh, not yet. There are similar results for the real part of the orthogonal polynomial itself or for the imaginary part of the orthogonal polynomial itself, minus uh, the, correct, uh, the correct bias. I should say that the imaginary part is, is kind of important as well if you want to directly get information on the eigenvalues, because the imaginary part is very much related to the counting function of eigenvalues. So if you know the, the imaginary part of the determinant, of the log determinant, at a certain theta, you know how many, how many eigenvalues there were between 0 and that theta. So fluctuations of that are very much related to what we are discussing. OK, well, I promised you a description of W. So what is the description of W? <coughs> so uh, take the, both the real part uh, or the imaginary part for the description that we care, forget about the imaginary, just think of the real part of phi k star. Put it in the exponent while subtracting something. The constants are taken in such a way that this quantity, the maximum of that, is smaller than log k by a log log term. So in particular, this thing here is, with high probability, always negative. Okay? So you take this exponential of this random variable, you multiply it by the same random variable, basically, except that you make it positive. And <coughs> the argument, the claim is, or a proposition, is that the integral of that converges to this d infinity. So this W that I mentioned before is just the log of the infinity. Okay? Now, for people, again, for people who know something about that, if everything here were Gaussian, what is written here is a critical Gaussian multiplicative chaos associated with that Gaussian field. This is derivative matrix. It's a derivative. Well, that's a critical GMC. I prefer not to talk about it as a, Although you can give it to it an interpretation, I prefer to not think of it as a derivative Martingale, but rather as a critical Gaussian multiplicative. The term derivative Martingale originally comes from branching random walk, and this is a, the, there is kind of a caricature branching random walk behind the story, but it's really not a branching random walk. So. Anyway, the, it's a very explicit object. These guys do converge after rescaling to Gaussians. So you would believe that if this converge to Gaussian, this will converge to the critical Gaussian GMC. And the law of that one we know, due to work of Remy a few years ago. So, so, and we know that it is a log of the total mass. The reason for the name total mass is that you can think of this object as a random measure on the unit circle. So what is written here is really, especially that I took here a plus, is just a random finite measure on the unit circle. And the integral of this is just the total mass of that measure. And the statement is that this shift from the gamble, this additive shift from the gamble, is really the total mass of that beast. OK? Uh, let me say some words about the structure of so 
a lot of that is borrowing elements from that paper I mentioned before of uh, Shaibi, Madol, and Najnudel, who were the first to really introduce seriously the use of these recursions in the study of the maximum or of high points. And what did they do? Well, the first step is to say, if I'm looking at large values of phi and star, there's a very, it's after all, it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree n. So by general, if I'm interested in the maximum, I don't need to look at the polynomial everywhere. It's enough to take n or two n points. That will be enough. So it's kind of enough to look at this object at a grid of size n, or actually slightly more, it turns out, we need, but <coughs> for conceptually, on the grid of size n. Now, recall that this phi k that we are introduced is essentially a random walk. So it, it, the scaling limit of that is really a Brownian motion. So it looks very much like a Brownian motion. So you can, and remember this psi that uh, we had, which were telling you, in fact, for two different directions, how does the evolution of the relative phase look like? And now if you look at this relative phase, you observe one thing. First of all, you observe that you have a theta here which is related to the phase difference. So the smaller theta, and remember, the, the phase differences we look at can be very small. They can be 1 over n, right? Because we, we are on the grid 1 over n. So they start at 1 over n, and they can be macroscopic of order 1. And then you have a noise, which for large k is going to be a small noise. So uh, what, you, what you really expect is that this difference essentially remains small until when? Until theta times k becomes large. So until theta times k becomes of order of order 1. Um, so yeah, that's a, this e to the k is a, is a mistake. Sorry about that. It should be theta k. So and, and st until this object is of order 1, and then you start to have a drift that pushes the things apart. And in fact, you can do a back of envelope computation and convince yourself that after that, the further elements are going to become more and more independent because they will be sums of independent variables that look like Gaussian, but with different oscillating frequencies. So you have, when you're summing Gaussians with two different uh, cosines, let's say, what you are going to see are independent random variables if the cosines are not at the, at the same frequency. And this tells you, this gives you a moral picture, a mental picture. And the mental picture is the following. So think of the points on the circle at spacing 1 over n. Then as long as delta theta so, so this is kind of a moral, a moral picture. You should think of it as logarithmic scales. So this is the finest logarithmic <coughs> scale, and this is a cor coarsest logarithmic scale where you have only one point. And the picture I told you before says that up until this critical point, which is exactly the point where delta theta times uh, n is of order 1, the things evolve more or less the same at two different angles. Once you pass this critical point, the things behave more or less independently. So coming back to the terminology of branching random walk and derivative martingales, if this were true, then this is a branching random walk. Namely, it's a, it's a tree on which you have increments on the edges that are iid. And you are just looking at the maximum at depths and, and this is a theory that is extremely well developed and simple and at these days are understood, uh, are, is completely well understood. So that's a mental picture. And the difficulty is to make this mental picture correct. And uh, etc. Now, for Gaussian fields, an important tool you have are comparison 
inequality. So Gaussian, Gaussian process has a very nice comparison inequalities that allow you to say, well, if I have one Gaussian process whose covariance dominates the covariance of another Gaussian process, then the maximum of one is dominating the maximum of the other. And therefore, you can kind of sandwich an arbitrary Gaussian field between two caricatures like that. I don't want to give the exact details, but you can do it rigorously. You can exactly sandwich it between two such caricatures and therefore obtain the limit results. For non-Gaussian fields, we don't have such a cheap tool, so we need to do something slightly, slightly different. So, uh, so uh, okay. So you have to work hard. Um, now, coming back to uh, the branching picture, what did I do with it? Looking for the eraser. So an important part of the story for branching random walk is kind of to split the evolution on this tree to three parts. Somehow the beginning of the tree <coughs> where you don't have very nice behavior because things are very correlated and they kind of propagate all the way down. The bottom of the tree, for technical reasons, you want to split it. And then you have something where it's not so important what happens, as long as it's roughly uh, tree-like. So that will turn out to be the important, the important structure here. So to, to, connect, to connect to what I'm going to tell you in a moment, think of this height as being k1, and think of this height as being k2. Those are some parameters that will eventually go to infinity. And, uh, and uh, the idea is to, 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 do, to say the following. Well, uh, this bottom of the tree, all that it does, it gives me some kind of random function here, which maybe if I tell you what the function is here, the increment will be of a law that does not depend on this exact value. So you will get some kind of, so if you, if you, if you took uh, your, your magnifying glasses and you looked what happens down here, you will get some random function on an interval of size k1, and it will look like something like that. And as k1 goes to infinity, this function also goes to infinity, this width go to infinity, etc. So that's the part of the bottom which translated to here, it's kind of the end of the recursions. It's the recursions for k large that are getting towards n. Okay, so what you can do is to define around certain centerings, uh, which we call theta j, which are the, the, this point, or on the circle it's just some kind of lattice of spacing which is uh, uh, essentially n, uh, sorry, the, the spacing is 1 over n times e to the k1, something like that. <coughs> we can look at the function around it. So we look at the phi star in a small arc around the, around the limit. And then on this arc you can introduce a random variable which is a maximum on that arc. And now you can introduce a process which has three components. The angle you look at, the height of the maximum, and the function itself on the interval of length 2k1. Okay? And as I said, for three lovers, this is really the picture. 
you think of that as what is happening towards the, the bottom of the tree. Now, if you look at that, the extra noise that you get here is small. And so it, you should convince yourself, or you could convince yourself, that this converges to a stochastic differential equation. And this stochastic differential equation is driven by the noise this, in these alpha coefficients. So turns out, after you do the correct rescaling, in fact, rescaling to scale coordinates instead of k, but actually the dyadic k, you get an equation which is of this form. Uh, and um, and uh, um, of course, if you let it run for k1 units of time, it induces a law on the space of continuous function on that, on that interval. And we call that uh, pk1. And now you look at the height minus what typically should be the centering, and you create a point process. Okay, so this is a point process which has these three coordinates: the where you are, what is your height, and how do you look around that point. And uh, up to certain transformation that is given by these formulas. You can transfer it to a height and uh, this law of the process. This law of the process, you just have to shift it down because everything here goes to infinity. What you really want to do is to look around the maximum and look at the process around the maximum. So you have a high point, which you shift it down, and you want to look at the process around the maximum. So in reality, <coughs> this process is going to look around its maximum. This process is going to look like some process that goes down. That's, that turns out to be the case. And the weights, of course, getting wider and wider. And the, the, maybe the most important part of the proof is to say that this process, which is a random process on the, on the uh, random matrix side, can be approximated well by a Poisson point process. And this Poisson point process has two components. One is a component that essentially depends on everything that is coming from the top, which tells you which angles are more likely than other based on the top. And then an independent part, which is a Poisson point process, which, is a, which is a, has the lo law of the solutions of this differential equation, stochastic <laughs> differential I wrote before. So you should think of it as some kind of modulated Poisson process coming from the top with this extra uh, modulation of the curve, which is completely independent of it. And uh, the main result is that this extremal process that I described before, which had the, the height together with the shifted, uh, the shifted uh, function, the distance between it and this Poisson process I've just described goes to zero as first n goes to infinity and then k1 goes to and in fact, to say it uh, slightly more precisely, here I did not tell you, in, in this description, I did not tell you too much about this d infinity, where it comes from. But in reality, it comes from the picture I drew before. Namely, you actually condition on what is happening here. Let's call this height k2. You have this intermediate region, and you have this k1 region. And the actual result is that if you look at dk2, at, at this region at depth k2, this is, oh, it contains all the, informa all the information you need from that is the profile of the height at that level. And it determines the intensity of that Poisson point process that we discussed before. And so, so this is modulating the intensity of a Poisson point process. 
And eventually, the total mass of this dK2 is going to tell you how many points you have in this Poisson point process at a certain height. So this is, so the, the main statement is the one I'm saying here. Namely, if I look at what happens at level K1 and K2, and uh, introduce a process in which the law on dK2 is essentially going to, it's a measure determined by uh, a certain resolution of the uh, equation on the tree, and I look at the total mass of it, then the triple that involve that and the height and the local decoration around the height converges to that Poisson point process. Okay? So that's, uh, that's, the main, that's the main result. Now, uh, th that's a very uh, general and very high level description. Let me give in the last few minutes a little bit more uh, insight on how you actually accomplish that. So the first, what you can do is you can condition on uh, a lattice of size n over k1 or n over e to the k1, which means condition on the tree, it would correspond to condition on that depth. And now you have a procedure in which you can prove that the increments from that are going to be in mesoscopic and macro macroscopic separations are going to be essentially independent. So we have a tool for proving Poisson, or in this case, conditional Poisson convergence, given random variables that are not exactly independent, but that have only local correlation. There's a method called the two moments suffice based on Stein's method in probability that tells you that if you can show that the dependence is only local and that uh, on global scales you have essential independence, then your limit is going to be a Poisson. I'm making a caricature, but not a very big caricature. So that will take care of all this decoration, and at the end, all these things are going to affect an additive constant in the limit law. And this additive constant, this I'm not promising ever to identify. So anticipating the next question of Jan, <laughs> not us, someone else. <laughs> okay. Um, once you have got gotten read, uh, go, uh, once you have done that, you're in a very good situation because all you care about is a certain intensity of this Poisson process, and for that, there's a classical first and second moment method that works. Namely, for each of the rays, which means each of the solutions of the recursion leading with a particular angle on our grid, you ask it to do something which is typically what a walk, a random walk, would do if you asked it to end very high. Okay? So that's exactly what is happening. So we fix this K2, which is going to be very large. And we ask, we only consider those parts of pass which follow a particular profile. Okay, I'm not describing what exactly this profile, but this picture should give a very good idea. In dyadic scale, it essentially should look like a random walk or a Brownian motion conditioned to reach high. That's what it should do. And uh, and that, of course, in order to do that, you have to show that paths that don't follow this recipe will not contribute to the maximum. So we do that. Okay? And uh, uh, I already talked about the Poisson. Now, conditioned on what happened in the very beginning, conditioned, if you tell me what happened in the very beginning, which means you gave me the solution of the recursion up to level K2, or E to the K2, uh, the structure I just told you and the inherent decorrelation you have because of the, the recursions decorrelate at certain scales allow you to predict precisely uh, um, the distribution 
of what will happen at this level or the total intensity at the level K1. And in fact, this is where the gamble is born. This is a completely general phenomenon. It's very robust. It holds in essentially all the problems, log correlated problems I've ever worked on. You always have this bulk behavior in which uh, a gamble will emerge from just taking the maximum. It's also true for IID random variables. If you take some of IIDs with certain tail conditions, the maximum will be gamble, period. So something like that happens, modulo knowing what happens here. And now what happens here is encoded in this derivative martingale that I described in the very beginning. And, uh, and we can, uh, we can uh, describe it. One word of, uh, one word of uh, caution, if you want to do the determinant, remember that at the end, when doing the determinant, we had this extra random variable that came about, which was connecting the phi and the phi star, or if you want, the real and imaginary part of phi. And uh, what this means is that even if you want only to do the log determinant, the modulus of the log determinant, you really have to keep track throughout of this whole pass. So the whole story I told you about keeping this pass and keeping it all the way, it's not just because we can. We have to do it, because if you don't do it, you will, never be, you will be able maybe to control the maximum of the characteristic of the phi star, but not the maximum of the determinant. OK, so, so at the end, we get this picture. And I think my time is more or less up, so I'll finish here. Thank you. Questions? So what it basically remains to identify this? So what remains is we have this formula for the total mass. We know that the things kind of converge to Gaussian. But there is a miracle. Somewhere along the way, there is a miracle and that I have not emphasized. But thank you for the question, so I'll emphasize it now. So there are two ways to look at it. One is to look at it uh, slightly inside the unit circle. In that case, you can write this uh, whole polynomial, and you can write the expansion of this polynomial <coughs> as a power series. And the coefficients of this power series, you can show, converge to Gaussians. And in fact, this was sh shown in some work of. You mean at fixed uh, distance? At fixed distance from the boundary, they converge to Gaussian. And this was sh shown by, uh, by uh, Najnudel and uh, Scheibe closely related results that I'm not talking about. But what we do here is something slightly different. We have this random variable, this Verblumsky coefficients alpha k. And we look at the recursion of that. Now, I told you that everything depends. This d depends on the top of the tree. But in the top of the tree, the variables are not Gaussian. So you could ask me, what, the, what is happening here? On the top of the tree, they are not Gaussian. You tell me everything depends on the top of the tree, and you still expect a Gaussian convergence. <laughs> and I would say this, this, of course, baffles me a lot, because, uh, for example, if you just take the trigonometric power series I wrote in the very beginning, and you just change the first coefficient and make it non-Gaussian, then the whole series is not Gaussian. Okay. There is a miraculous um, combination of, the com of these coefficients that enters into the coefficients of the power series. The traces of that you can see in the diaconis Shashahani formula, which tell you something about exactly this power series or the coefficients of the power series, that makes them, yes, depending on the beginning of the, uh, of the recursion, but also doing a mysterious combination that makes them Gaussian. And this is what you need to control. So, so if you wrote the derivative Martingale slightly inside, it's very easy to show that this converges to something Gaussian. 
you are not slightly inside, then you have to do something, and this is what hopefully will be done, but is not done yet. It's certainly not done yet. Uh, the constant is much more complicated. Maybe I should say that the, the extra constant which you get, this I have no hope of getting because this would really require at many, many places, but in particular in this decoration part, to try to get the constant out of the stochastic differential equation. And, and maybe it's possible, but I'm not sure it's worth the effort. Mentioned another representation that's equivalent to Philip um, the one that uh, mainly Brian Sutton figured out, where instead of using the eigenvalues, there's this Yancey composition, um, where you, you form uh, basically an orthogonal matrix of bi diagonals. Um, and I'm just wondering if that might technically, I, I'm a big fan of the CFT composition of eigenvalues. I'm wondering if it might be technically easier to work with. Might be, I don't know. Since I've not looked at it, it's hard for me to 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 answer. Um, what are the random variables involved? Yeah, well, it's on this slide here. But, uh, no, but uh, what, what are they? So, so basically, they're not they're Gaussian. Like, you have beta random variables. Yeah, right? so it's uh, so. That's I, kind of the trade-off. You use beta to be Gaussian. No, those are beta. Oh, those so are I'm beta sure. here. You're right. Actually, that's everything right. here is beta yeah, to so start. It, with. It's kind of the same. In some so the question is whether you will get any simpler recursion. Right. For us, the, the key is a recursion. And somehow I don't believe you get a simpler recursion, but, uh, but maybe, I don't know. If you got a scalar recursion, of course, that would be a big difference, but, but that, that doesn't seem to me like it. I don't know, maybe you get a scalar recursion and then things are slightly, you don't have to separate to phase and- uh, I'll show it to you later. Maybe maybe okay. okay, great. Questions? Well, if not, let's thank Ophir again.